Hello, I'm Jordan Maxwell, and for the next hour and a half, I want to talk with you about the symbol you see behind me. It is the National Coat of Arms of the Soviet Union. It's the symbol for world communism. And while the Soviet Union may not any longer exist as a communist state, make no mistake about it, communism dominates the world. And today communism is pervading in our country of America and around the globe. And unfortunately, the people of this world are not aware of the insidious symbolism of secret societies that are now taking over the entire globe. And the people of this globe today have no idea what these symbols mean. So it is my purpose to present as best I can the information about the lineage of this symbol, the history of this communist movement, and the symbol of the Soviet Union. America is now a world communist state. You need to understand the symbolism of world communism and where these symbols come from and the secret societies who are financing the overthrow of the United States government by a communist world power. Secret societies hidden behind world leaders. So in the next hour and a half, I hope to enlighten you a bit about the symbols of world communism. And keeping in mind that world communism, Nazism, fascism, all of the isms that tend to destroy freedom, liberty, and justice for the world is now being perpetrated in America. You need to understand the symbols of world communism and their history. So for the next hour and a half, as I said, go with me through the background and the hidden or occult history of the Soviet communist world movement. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Soviet Communist State Arms. The symbol you're looking at is referred to as the State Arms or the Soviet National Symbol for World Communism of the Soviet Union. This is a very long story, but this symbol is of profound significance even today. Let's start with a 1953 Back in 1953, the California legislature issued a group of books, and this was the 11th in the series of 13. <clears throat> and it was called the Senate Investigating Committee on Education. And it was published by the state of California, the Senate. And um, here on page 168, it says... Since many intelligent persons, even in high official positions, do not appear to have acquainted themselves with the real nature and seriousness of communism, it is perhaps appropriate to give briefly some really informative and authentic data concerning it. Communism and Russia are by no means synonymous. Russia merely occupies the unfortunate position of being communism's first victim. Communism is synonymous with world revolution and seeks the destruction of all nations, including abolition of patriotism, religion, marriage, the family, private property, and all political and civil liberties, and the establishment of a worldwide dictatorship of the so-called proletariat, which is an autocratic, self-constituted dictatorship by a small group of self-perpetuating revolutionists. So this is what we're talking about tonight, is the communist movement, world communism. Now the next page went on to say <clears throat> that so-called modern communism is apparently the same hypocritical and deadly world conspiracy to destroy civilization that was founded by the secret order of the Illuminati in Bavaria on May 1st, 1776, and that raised its hoary head here in our colonies at critical periods before the adoption of our federal constitution. See the book World Revolution by Nesta Webster. The World Revolution conspiracy appears to have been so well organized as to be ever continuing 
and ever on the alert to take advantage of every opportunity presenting itself or that the conspirators could create. It is significant in this connection that as early as 1783, when unsettled conditions and dissatisfaction in some quarters had arisen in the American colonies, a subversive anonymous sermon was circulated among the colonial army to incite dissatisfaction and rebellion. George Washington immediately called the army together and in addressing them used this significant language. Remember this is from the book Marshall's Life of Washington, page 86 through 87, volume 4. Quoting George Washington, 1783, he said, quote, My God, what can this writer have in view by recommending such measures? Can he be a friend to the army? Can he be a friend to this country? Rather, is he not an insidious foe, some emissary perhaps from New York, plotting the ruin of both by sowing seeds of discord and separation between the civil and military powers of the continent? And what a compliment does he pay to our understanding when he recommends measures which are either alternative and practical in their nature. He goes on to say, quote, It is plain that Washington believed that the center of this secret conspiracy, so far as this country was concerned, to be located in New York and felt it to be his duty to make such a illusion. While the center of such conspiracy, so far as this country is concerned, has continued to use New York as its base, up to the present time it is very apparent that in recent times New York has held and is now holding the center of the stage for communist activities in this country. The recognition of May 1st, 1776 as the founding date of this world revolution conspiracy is not difficult to understand when it is realized that May Day is frequently celebrated even in recent times by rioting and bloodshed on a worldwide scale. <clears throat> this is an interesting paragraph. It was not until 1847 or 1848 that the communist conspirators who had therefore theretofore operated in secret came out in the open with the manifesto of the Communist Party by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, boldly proclaiming against practically everything upon which civilization is based, against God, religion, the family, <clears throat> individual liberties, and so forth. But the next, uh, the, the bottom paragraph is very important. It says, in issuing this manifesto, the communist conspirators evidently believed that the time had arrived when with the aid of ignorant victims, a worldwide takeover could be accomplished. But there were not enough ignorant victims then, and the expected coup failed. The communist conspirators thereupon conceived the plan for the future of supplementing the long-established secret conspiracy in existence since May 1st, 1776. This is the founding date of real communism. May 1st, 1776, with an unremittent public campaign for victims among the ignorant of all nations, and in an attempt to hide from view the underlying hypocritical conspiracy existing since May 1st, 1776, it was decided that in such public campaign, the Manifesto of 1848 should be heralded as the founding date of communism, and Karl Marx falsely proclaimed as its author. Karl Marx, in fact, did not write uh, the Communist Manifesto. He was merely a front man who put his name. The Communist Manifesto was put together by a group of men called the League of Just Men. Uh, later on, that League of Just Men became known as the League of Communists. And later on, their, their book became known as the Manifesto of the Communist Party. But it was the League of Just Men who wrote the Communist Manifesto, not Karl Marx. 
Anyway, in a conspiracy against God and man, <clears throat> Reverend Clarence Kelly, uh, this, this particular book was a study of the beginnings and the early history of the great communist movement of the world. Reverend Clarence Kelly. And in the book, he talks about regarding these same secret and powerful forces, Benjamin Disraeli, the English statesman, gave testimony in the British House of Commons on July 14, 1856. And on that occasion, he said, quote, there is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house. It, I mean the secret societies. It is useless to deny because it's impossible to conceal that a great part of Europe and the whole of Italy and France and a great portion of Germany, to say nothing of other countries, is covered with a network of these secret societies just as the surfaces of the earth are now being covered with railroads. And 20 years later, on September 10, 1876, Benjamin Disraeli was moved to make the following statement, quote, The governments of the present day have to deal not merely with other governments, with emperors, kings, and ministers, but also with the secret societies which have everywhere their unscrupulous agents and can at the last moment upset all the government's plans. Much of what this historian had to say is enlightening. Uh, he cites, for example, the explicit testimony of one who was himself in close touch with the inner circle of this secret society and possessed knowledge of the secret society. He was referring to a doctor who, in April of 1914, uh, wrote in an issue of the French occultist magazine, Mystica, under the pseudonym of Pappas, this uh, doctor, member of this French occultist uh, society, and wrote in the Mystica magazine, he said, quote, Side by side with international politics of each state, there exist certain obscure organizations of international politics. These men that take part in these councils are not the professional politicians or the brilliantly dressed ambassadors, but certain unpretentious unknown men, high financiers who are superior to the vain ephemeral politicians who imagine that they govern the world. Uh, Abraham Lincoln made an interesting quote also, and the book is quoting Abraham Lincoln. And he said, quote, when we see a lot of framer frame timbers, different positions of which we know to have been gotten out at different times in different places by different workmen, Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, for instance. And when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, or if a single piece be lacking, we see the place and the frame exactly fitting, fitted and prepared to yet bring such a piece in. In such a case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen, Frank, Roger, and James all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first lick was struck. So here, Abraham Lincoln is giving the, um, the example of how you can see uh, that there is an absolute conspiratorial apparatus being put into place. And he understood that. Now, in the book Secret Societies and Subversive Movements by Nesta Webster, she was the lady that was quoted in the California State Document, if you remember. Her first book was called World Revolution. This is the second book called Secret Societies and Subversive Movements. In the 12th chapter, The Secret Societies in England, there is a an article, a piece in this uh, 12th chapter, it was very interesting. Uh, she, Nesta Webster, interviewed a lady who was a member of a secret society called Stella Matratina. Stella Matratina, a secret, secret society, a quasi-Masonic secret society, I might add, in England, later became known as the Order of the Golden Dawn with Aleister Crowley uh, at the head of it. 
but before Crowley it was not, it was called Stella Matratina. And so Nesta Webster is interviewing a lady who was a member of this Stella Matratina. And it says, uh, in the opinion of an initiate who belonged for years to Stella Matratina, the dynamic force employed known as Kundalini is simply an electromagnetic force of which the sex force is a part and on which the adepts know how to play. And the unseen hand behind all the seeming spiritism of these orders is a system of very subtle and cunning hypnotism and suggestion. She went on to say further that the aim of this group, like that of all subversive esoteric orders, is by means of such processes as eurythmics, meditation, symbols, uh, ceremonies, formulas to awaken, to awaken this force and produce false illumination for the purpose of obtaining spiritual seership which is at most clairvoyance and clairaudience. The ceremonies of the order are hypnotic and by suggestion create the necessary mental and astral atmosphere, hypnotize and prepare the members to be willing tools in the hands of the controlling adepts. The same initiate has communicated to me the following conclusions concerning the group in question with the permission to quote them verbatim. This was the quote from the lady who was a member of Stella Matratina. She said, I have been convinced that we as an order have come under the power of some very evil occult order, profoundly versed in science, both occult and otherwise. Though not infallible, their methods being, their methods being black magic, that is to say, electromagnetic power, hypnotism, and powerful suggestion. And here is the point. We are convinced that the order is being controlled by some sun order, after the nature of the Illuminati, if not by that order itself. So this is the object of my presentation. I want to look at this thing called a sun order, which is after the nature of the Illuminati, if not that order itself. A sun order, very ancient, ancient concept that can be traced all the way back into the beginnings of mankind. There have always been sun orders. But the important part is, how do these sun orders today manipulate world events. The sun has always been a very powerful symbol and a metaphor for all religions and all peoples on the face of the earth. But let's talk about the sun itself first as a powerful symbol. As we said, the sun has always represented a very powerful spiritual force in the universe, obviously because it gives us life and warmth, it lights the world, so naturally, the sun is a very important symbol to all mankind and all races. And as far back in mankind's history, we can see ancient sun worship. Here as far back with the, um, and the most ancient peoples, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, uh, their helmets, you can see on the Assyrian helmets, the, especially the two on the right, upper and lower, having sun burst symbols on their helmets. This is far back into the Assyrian Empire. Um, then, of course, we see that um, the Romans picked up the same idea from the Assyrians, and they had sun helmets uh, because the sun was very important, especially in the Roman Empire. And we see it, of course, with the Native Americans and even today in South America, uh, such as uh, the different races of people who celebrate the coming of the sun, even Native Americans, as I said. So it's a, it's a symbol that has been used for thousands of years, worshiping the sun. One of the oldest symbols of the sun was and still is the eagle. And this is something a lot of people do not know, that almost all the ancient civilizations in the world had an eagle 
somewhere in their symbolism, and the eagle always, and in every case, always represented the same thing. It was always a symbol of the sun. Why? Because eagles can fly so high, and they have sharp vision, and they're able to see things and overview the whole earth. So ancient Romans, of course, as I said, used the eagle to symbolize the sun. Here's uh, Solas Invectae, the Roman god with his symbol for the sun was an eagle. Eagles were used all over the Roman Empire to symbolize the sun. And fascists, of course, in Europe uh, used the eagle also for the same reason, to symbolize the sun. It's a Roman eagle fascist signet ring. The eagle symbolizing the sun. And you'll see the eagle is perched on a fasci. <clears throat> That's another whole subject we'll get into another time. The symbol of the fasci is a bundle of sticks, which you'll see the eagle perched on, with a uh, hatchet head. It's called a fasci. It's the symbol of world fascism or world totalitarian fascist state. The most brutal fascist corporate state symbol. And the eagle representing the sun, showing that the sun is connected to world fascism. Here it is on a coin in uh, 1849 in Rome, in Italy. You'll see the eagle perched on the Roman fasci. Here it is on an American quarter. American quarter, just like the Roman, because America is modern-day Rome. Now, Hitler and the Nazis also used eagles for the same reason, to symbolize the sun. You'll always see the eagle perched on the sun, and of course the swastika represented the sun and moving across the earth. As the sun rolled across the sky, that's why the legs of the cross were moving. It was walking across the sky. Sun symbols and eagles were one and the same thing in Nazi Germany. Now we still have today the use of eagles as a symbol of the sun uh, all over the world. Here in, uh, in Florence, Italy, we have a church that has a sun eagle on the door. So eagles have always been synonymous and symbolism with the sun. The reason why this is important because we're talking about a secret society that is based on the Illuminati, if not that very, that very society itself. And the most important symbol of the Illuminati is the sun, because it brings light into the world. And as I said, it was always represented in the ancient world by an eagle. Even state arms around the world of the sun and the eagle. Now, <clears throat> here's the seal of the President of the United States. That's a very interesting symbol, and I don't want to get off my subject too, too much, but that, uh, that symbol is very important. You will see... Uh, and one talent, the um, eagle is holding 13 arrows, and the other is 13 leaves. There are 13 berries, um, 13 stripes. Uh, very interesting symbolism, and we'll talk about that in another time, because there's a, there's a whole world of, of knowledge of symbolism wrapped up in the presidential seal. But nonetheless, we're seeing an eagle, the eagle on the dollar bill. Eagles have only two wings, left wing and right wing. That's why we have in America the sun order that controls America's politics has two wings. They're called left wing and right wing. 
And obviously, the left wing and right wing has to be controlled by a brain in the middle. That's your hands, both left hand and right hand, is controlled by one brain in the middle. So is the left wing and right wing of American politics is controlled by the same mind. Both sides are controlled by the same people. All right, we have seen that the eagle is a symbol of the sun. The sun in its rising brings light, obviously, into the everyday world of mankind. So mankind has always waited for the sun <clears throat> to come up for, so that he could take control over the earth. At night, it was very dark and fearful for the ancient man. And so that's what the sun happily does for the earth. It chases away the darkness of night, and it illuminates uh, the earth, and therefore it is a symbol for illumination of the mind. It illuminates. Uh, the sun is always, as I said, representing light, intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. So the sun has always symbolized not only the light for mankind to see his way through each day, but more importantly, the intellectual and spiritual enlightenment of the inner soul or the mind of mankind. So that's why we have newspapers who are supposedly there to, en to enlighten us as to the news of the world, keeps you enlightened. And so many of the newspapers have the term sun, always the symbol of the sun, newspapers around the world, because the sun represents intellectual, spiritual enlightenment. You'd be surprised how many newspapers, magazines have the word sun and the symbol of the sun in them. So we see the same basic symbol used all over the world. The rising sun symbolizes spiritual and intellectual enlightenment. Here you'll see the rising sun behind the mountains, and that's a very important symbol we're going to get into now, that sun order, and it's symbol of the sun rising behind the mountains. That's a very important symbol, the sun rising behind two mountains. We'll tell you why in a few moments, but you'll see it everywhere. Even this uh, dollar bill, as far back as 2005, but this is a very old uh, silver dollar, and it the name of the silver dollar is uh, Liberty Marching Toward the Dawn of a New Day. Here it is in Russian. Soviet. Even Obama uses it. There's a good reason why he uses it. It's a Soviet communist symbol. And we see the symbolism generally picked up around the world and used in, you know, in commercial and corporations, etc. Uh, even the uh, shell sign features the sunrise on the shell sign. Here's the, uh, a, a new stamp in America. You'll see the two pyramids of the two mountains and the inverted triangle, which is the sun rising between the two mountains. This is a very fascist Nazi uh, Architect. This is very fascist, and you'll see the fascist Nazi eagle that was uh, popular in Germany under Adolf Hitler, and the Nazis is now on an American stamp, and he is perched on a fasci, a bundle of sticks. Very impressive con con uh, uh, national socialist symbolism in America. Nazism, fascism the eagle, the sunrise between two mountains, all of this is replete in America, everywhere. And in churches and religions in general, you'll see uh, suns behind the mountain. And this is a whole subject that we'll get into another time, because this is a very big subject about how the church uses the sun rise behind the mountains. Uh, there's a very good reason why. And we'll get into that, to that another time. But just to show how the symbolism is used in politics, in corporations, religion, churches. 
uh, even uh, the sunrise Torah symbol. The Jews use the sun rising over Jerusalem uh, all the time. That's a very important symbol. Here we have sunrise in Jerusalem. There's a reason why the sunrise is important because it's a symbol of the Illuminati, the illumination of the world by the illuminated minds. And of course, Charles, Charles Tez Russell, when he founded the International Bible Students Association back in the 1868, um, Zion's Watchtower today is known as Jehovah's Witnesses. That was a uh, Illuminati Zionist movement as far back as 1868. And the sunrise was used uh, profusely in the old watchtowers. Now the rising of the morning sun is called the dawn. So when the spiritual or intellectual enlightenment comes into your heart or mind, we say things like, oh, it just dawned on me. Why do we say that? Oh, yes, it just dawned on me. That's what the sun does. It dawns. The dawn is a, it says here, the rising sun is a symbol of hope and a new beginning. The dawn. It's a Christian concept. And if you go on the web to Google and put in Christian new dawn, you will see hundreds and hundreds of churches and church groups and Christian groups uh, going by the name of Christian new dawn. The new dawn movements. Easter celebrates the new dawn of Christ brought into the world. Christian singers, the new dawn singers. Uh, Christian, his Christian churches, the new dawn Christian church. So here's a, a picture of a, a Christian celebration in, and you'll see on the backdrop you'll see the, the crosses and then you'll see in the middle the mountains with the sun rising on the new dawn. Most Christians have no idea in the world the significance of these symbols, have no concept in the world about what they're being uh, led into. But, and of course with this new dawn we get into something called the new day, obviously. Christian um, symbolism still. And don't forget about the Jewish Kabbalah. The Jews also have the same symbol. That's what Christians have gotten it from. It's from the old ancient Jewish religion. Uh, in the book, Nine and a Half Mystics, the Kabbalah today, on uh, the ninth chapter is called The Fragrance of Eden, the way of one who is caught between the suns of a dying and dawning day. So this is a, a very important Jewish symbol also in synagogues, the sun rising for the new dawn. Um, and here was a song that was written about the second uh, about the Jewish people uh, during the Second World War. It says, "The first to perish were the children, abandoned orphans, the world's best and bleak earth's brightest. These children might have been our comfort for these sad, moot, bleak faces. Our new dawn might have arisen." So. This whole idea of the coming of the Messiah, according to ancient Jerusalem and ancient Jewish teachings, has nothing to do, in fact, with a man coming to save the world. In Judaism, the Messiah is actually a messianic period of time. And, of course, uh, the second paragraph talking about this red heifer, silly nonsense about a red heifer or a red bull that was born in Israel. Um, this goes back to the worship of Taurus, the bull, and the constellation when the sun was in the constellation of Taurus. This is why Moses uh, was, then uh, the Israelites were worshiping a golden calf. The golden calf was the sun, which is golden, and the calf, which is a, which is a uh, Taurus the bull, the constellation of Taurus. That's a whole subject we'll get into also. But even today, uh, they're talking about a red heifer born in Israel. And the second paragraph goes on to say that tradition records that a red heifer in our generation is the herald of the Messianic era. It is certainly an important development toward the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. Our ancient sages taught that Israel's redemption could be compared to the dawn. 
In the beginning, it progresses very slowly, but as it continues, it grows brighter and brighter. So this whole idea of Messiah is not a man coming back, but it is a messianic era, a time period. And this time period is when the rebuilding of the Holy Temple, and this whole idea and concept of rebuilding the Holy Temple is a Masonic idea. Illuminati, Freemasonry, dreamt up the idea of rebuilding the Holy Temple. It has nothing to do with Judaism. It has to do with Masonic illumination, the dawn. And, of course, the Nazis were big on this thing, too, and this idea. The Nazis were big also by saying, Father Lamb, Father Lamb, show us the sign your children have waited to see. The morning will come when the world is mine. Tomorrow belongs to me. The Nazis were really big on using not just the eagle to represent the sun, but the Nazis were very big on the whole concept of the new dawn and the new day. We'll get into that in a few moments. If you go to the United Nations website and type in, go to the UN website and type in a new dawn, you will see there are many, many uh, articles about the new dawn. But what the UN is talking about, when it uses the term new dawn, is a new dawn for socialism or what we might call Soviet communism. That's the new dawn in the United Nations view. So here we have newspapers from the UK, and it says only a strategic partnership with China will keep this new dawn bright. Here is uh, Gordon Brown with his wife talking to Ted Kennedy, and it says Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of England, calls for a new dawn of collaboration with the U.S. and the European Union. Bush sees a bright dawn emerging. Uh, Here's Brown calls for a new world order, which would be a part of that truly global society of the new dawn. Even the Catholic Church is getting into the act, talking about the new world that's coming in the new dawn. And while we're talking about the U.K. and the United States working together for this new dawn, uh, we might also want to remember a, a very interesting and important uh, uh, article in August of 1914 in the Congressional Record. Now, in the Congressional Record, as far back as 1940, there was a uh, enter, entered into the Congressional Record a series of articles called. Um, Steps Toward British Union, a World State in International Strife. This was entered in August 1940 in the House of Representatives. Again, the title of this article that were were entered into the the, uh, congressional record. Uh, Think about what you're reading. Steps Toward British Union, a World State. An international war, international strike. And it says, uh, the uh, author of this is uh, Representative Thorkelson. And he said, Mr. Speaker, in order that the American people may have a clearer understanding of those who over a period of years have been undermining this American republic in order to return it to the British Empire, I have inserted in the record a number of articles to prove this point. These articles are entitled Steps Toward British Union, a World State, an International Strife, which is, uh, can be said another way. Steps Toward British Union with America, the bringing back of America into the British fold and the, uh, calling it the British Union, a world government a new world order, and international wars. It goes on to say, this is part one, and in this I include a hope expressed by Mr. Andrew Carnegie in his book, Triumph Democracy, and in this he expressed himself in this manner. Andrew Carnegie's saying, this is back in 1939-40, 
Andrew Carnegie said, let men say what they will. I say that as sure as the sun in the heavens once shone upon Britain and America united, so surely it is one morning to arise, to shine upon and greet again the reuniting of states of the British American Union. Well, you need to remember who the great enemy of Americans were in the Revolutionary War. It was a murderous, bloodletting war for freedom, not against uh, the Arab nations, it was against the British. And so here the Illuminati are planning to reunite America with the British and a new world order. Uh, over here on page 13, <clears throat> and the middle paragraph is very interesting. It says, let me call your attention. This is the congressman writing this. And he says, let me call your attention to the fact that on the reverse of the great seal of the United States, which appears on our dollar bills, you will find the exact symbol of the British Israel World Federation Movement. Now, this is very important. I'm going to go back over this. It said, let me call your attention to the fact that on the reverse of the great seal of the United States, which appears on our dollar bills, you will find the exact symbol of the British Israel World Federation Movement. This symbol is also carried on the literature of other organizations promoting a world government and a world religion. At the bottom of the circle surrounding the pyramid, you will find the wording Novus Ordo Seclorum. It was this new order that was advocated by Clinton Roosevelt several hundred years ago. And recently in the book called Philip Drew, and now followed by the executive. He says, do you not think as good American people that the administration has gone far from constitutional government when there is inscribed a symbol on the reverse of our great seal that advocates a new order, an order which means the destruction of our republic as formulated in the Constitution of the United States? Well, we're talking about a revolution to overthrow the United States. We can't forget Cecil Rhodes, a British statesman and empire builder. And in his last, he had many different wills because he was a very wealthy man. Cecil Rhodes was a British statesman and empire builder. He died in 1902. In his first five wills, he had many wills, very wealthy man. And the first five wills repeatedly called for he wished to have, quote, secret society, a secret society, the true aim and object whereof shall be the extension of British rule throughout the world, end quote. And eventually, quote, the ultimate recovery of the United States of America. So Cecil Rhodes left money to finance a secret society, the true aim and object whereof shall be the extension of British rule throughout the world and eventually the ultimate recovery of the United States of America. In his sixth and last will, he created the Rhodes Scholarship, limiting the eligible applicants to Anglo-Saxons who came from Great Britain, U.S., or Germany. So when you hear politicians bragging that they are Rhodes Scholars, just remember they are being promoted and financed by secret societies. The true aim and object whereof shall be the extension of British rule throughout the world and the ultimate recovery of the United States of America. Now here is the book Philip Drew that we talked about a few moments ago. There was a book put out early 1900s called Philip Drew Administrator. It was written by, here is President um, of the President of the United States, um, and next to him is a man named Colonel William Mandel House. Colonel William Mandel House, very wealthy uh, banker in Europe, but was a very close friend to the President of the United States back then, he wrote a, a book called Philip Drew Administrator. And in this book, he talked about 
the whole takeover of the United States and how the international banking cartels were going to do this. And one of the chapters is the prophet of a new day, uh, the exultant conspirators. Um, another one, administration of the republic. Philip Drew outlines his intentions, the new era in Washington. Uh, some of the others was like uh, another chapter was an international crisis, the reform of the judiciary, a new code of laws, the Federal Incorporation Act, the Federal, uh, the Federal Reserve Act, the new national constitution, the new state constitution, the rule of the bosses. Um, and a very interesting uh, chapter toward the end, on the bottom you'll see the unity of the northern half of the western hemisphere under the new republic. Well, that's what we had under Bush, the destruction of the United States as a sovereign power connecting the United States now with Canada and uh, Mexico. Well, here as far back as 1900, in the book, um, and Colonel Mendel House was outlining the unity of the northern half of the Western Hemisphere under a new republic and a new national constitution, and the rule of the bosses. This is a very important book, Prophet of the New Day. And here he was talking on the, in this chapter, Socialism is Dreamed of by Karl Marx. Cannot, he said, Socialism, as dreamed of by Karl Marx, cannot be entirely brought about by a comprehensive system of state ownership and by the leveling of wealth. If that were done without spiritual leveling, the result would be largely as you suggest. So the, there has to be some kind of a spiritual matrix added into this communism. So now let's take a look at what's going on in New York. Uh, George Washington felt that the Illuminati was trying to destroy the Republic as far back as the 1700s, 1800s. And uh, <clears throat> so the question is, what's going on in New York, the Empire State? But first remember the earlier quote in Secret Societies about a sun order. Nesta Webster talked about I have been, the lady said, I have been convinced that we as an order have come under the power of some very evil occult order, profoundly versed in science, both occult and otherwise, though not infallible, their methods being uh, black magic. And then she concludes by saying, we are convinced that the order, this is Stella Matratina or the order of Golden Dawn. We are convinced that the order is being controlled by some sun order after the nature of the Illuminati, if not by that order itself. A very interesting uh, quote, very, very important quote from Manly Palmer Hall, Manly P. Hall, the great Masonic uh, philosopher, and writer, uh, a brilliant man. Uh, in his book called Masonic Orders of Fraternity, he says this, and the four words, the direct descent of the essential program, and this is a very important quote. He says, the direct descent of the essential program of the esoteric schools was entrusted to groups already well conditioned for the work. The guilds, trade unions, similar protective and benevolent societies have been internally strengthened by the introduction of a new learning. The advancement of the plan required the enlargement of the boundaries of the philosophic overstate. A world fraternity was needed, sustained by a deep and broad program of education according to the method, meaning there's a method to the, all of this. Such a fraternity could not immediately include all men, but it could unite the activities of certain kinds of men, regardless of their racial and religious beliefs or the nations in which they dwelt. He goes on to say, these were the men of towardness, those sons of tomorrow, whose symbol was a blazing sun rising over the mountains of the east. That's a very important point. These were the men of towardness, those sons of tomorrow, whose symbol was the blazing sun rising over the mountains of the east. 
He goes on to say, while it is difficult to trace the elements of a pattern never intended to be obvious, but the broad shape of the design is dimly apparent, an invisible empire in the Empire State, New York. So this invisible empire is using the symbol of the blazing sun rising over the mountains of the east. You will see the blazing sun rising over the mountains of the east, and these were men of towardness, going back to old ancient England. Here we have the right noble and most towardly young prince, Prince Charles, Duke of York. And when the Duke of York in England, when that whole monstrosity moved into America to bring the secret society of England into America, it came through New York, the Empire State. And why is the uh, New York the Empire State? Well, U.S. President George Bush delivered a nationally televised speech in which he threatened the use of force to remove Iraq soldiers. And uh, from Kuwait, and which Iraq had recently invaded, he mentions the term New World Order in this speech for the first time. He also named, it was also named Towards a New World Order. So this is what the men of tomorrow, those men of tomorrow are working towards, a New World Order. And here we see Bush uh, working with uh, Gorbachev, a planning a new world order. Even our Strategic Studies Institute for the United States Army War College, this is the United States Army War College, published by the Strategic Studies Institute, in which uh, this publication, uh, The World in 2010, a new order of nations showing how the world is being carved up and the Strategic Studies Institute of the United States Army War College is a part of it. They're telling you that, in, that your very country is dividing up the world, <clears throat> a world which you're going to see, we will see in 2010, a complete new order of nations. But as far back as 1940, military generals were writing about America and the coming new world order. I like what Roosevelt said. There's a quote in Washington, D.C. at the Roosevelt Memorial. It says, they who seek to establish systems of government based on the regimentation of all human beings by a handful of individual rulers call this a new order. It is not new and it is not order. Going back to the California Senate report back in 1953, <clears throat> again, we uh, hear at the bottom, I'll call your attention to that bottom sentences, says it is plain that Washington believed the center of the secret conspiracy so far in this country was concerned to be located in New York. New York, the Empire State. This is where all of the fascist, Nazi, communistic, Dirt of the world as being drummed up against the American Republic. New York is the home of subversion for the world. Something needs to be done about the secret societies and the criminal associations operating in the media, television, motion pictures, operating from the home office of New York, the Empire State. Why is New York called the Empire State? Well, it's because of part of the uh, representing the British Empire. It's called the Commonwealth, British Commonwealth of Nations, or the British Empire. A Caesar of Rome, when the Caesars of Rome went into Britannia, their uh, seat of operations, their seat of government for Rome in Britannia, was in the city of York, England. So now we've got the Vatican uh, backing the British monarchy and coming into and in York, England, but now we have it moving into America and to New York, the Empire State. Back to uh, Cecil Rhodes, of course. He was the um, man who uh, was 
finance of setting up a secret society to overthrow the United States government. And we remember his will. That, well, this is what was being promoted. Now we need to look at James Billington's book, probably one of the most important books you're ever going to find, and you can still find it today, and you need to get this book and read it. This, I believe, is one of the most important books on this subject you can find anywhere. James Billington's book is called The Fire in the Minds of Men. James Billington is one of the most phenomenally interesting writers you will ever pick up a book. He is fascinating to read, but he, is, he has an incredible and impeccable credentials. Today, James Billington is the chief librarian for the Library of Congress. So this man is, is without a doubt, uh, well suited to discuss the, the, the story in his book about the communist world movement and how it was financed, who did it, what the symbols meant. This is really an important book, James Billington, and the book is called Fire in the Minds of Men. <clears throat> it's the origins of the revolutionary faith of all the revolutionary movements and secret societies of the world. So get the book. Order it from uh, um, Amazon. Or find it on, in, in bookstores. It's a very important book. Now, in the book Fire in the Minds of Men, in the uh, inside cover, it says, the history of modern revolutions is the story of people in the grips of ideas and beliefs. In this masterful work, James Billington, whose icon in the Acts, this was his first book, establishes him both as a formidable scholar and a sparkling storyteller. But in this book, The Fire in the Minds of Men, he traces the course of the revolutionary faith from its earliest origins in occult Freemasonry to the allegedly scientific Marxism of today. Now, in the uh, introduction is a profound paragraph in Fire in the Minds of Men. James Bellington says in the introduction, a recurrent mythic model for revolutionaries Early Romantics in young Karl Marx and the Russians of Lenin's time was Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods for the use of mankind. The Promethean faith of revolutionaries resembles in many respects the general modern belief that science would lead men out of darkness into light. But there was also a more pointed millennial assumption that on the new day that was dawning, the sun would never set. Early during the French Revolution was born something referred to as, quote, the solar myth of the revolution, suggesting that the sun was rising on a new era in which darkness would vanish forever. This image became implanted at a level of consciousness that simultaneously interpreted something real and produced a new reality. The new reality that they, the secret society, sought was radically secular and stringently simple. The idea was not the balanced complexity of the new American Federation, but the occult simplicity of its great seal, an all-seeing eye atop the pyramid over the words Novas Ordo Seclodo. Very important this is why in New York City at Rockefeller Plaza you will see Prometheus who stole fire from the gods to illuminate the minds of our masters on the earth. The godly wisdom uh, was stolen by the god Prometheus and brought to the earth and given to our illuminated minds or what we call those who we call Illuminati to illuminate our masters who control the human race implying that they have knowledge of the heavens and wisdom of the world that we um, mortal men do not have. That's why they are the Illuminati, the Illuminated Ones. So uh, I want to draw your attention to the top part again. It says, a recurrent mythic model for revolutionaries, early romantics, young Karl Marx in Russians of Lenin's time was Prometheus. Well, so it is today. Still, 
young communists and the communist people who financed the Communist Party, the Rockefellers, still have their god Prometheus at Rockefeller Center. And the American people, New Yorkers, every day going by uh, the Rockefeller Center never realize what that statue actually implies. It's Prometheus who stole fire from the gods in heaven and brought down to the Illuminati, intellectual, spiritual enlightenment, to rule over and control the world. Prometheus. Then in the back of the book, uh, under the uh, subheadings in the back of the book, talks about the solar revolution, the temple of the sun, uh, talks about the books that were written as far back as 1887, talking about uh, the, the, the year 2000 in New York. You know, as far back as the 1880s, there were books being written about looking forward to New York in the year 2000 and what's going to happen with mankind in the year 2000 in uh, New York. Well, a year later, we have the 9-11 stuff. Even speculation about the year 2000 began not with the futuristic futurology of the 1960s, but the year 2000 was important in a dynamic work written as far back as 1780 by the same figures who vented the word communist. So the very secret, secret societies out of New York and Europe who were developing what we call communism as far back as 1780s, uh, you know, George Washington knew about them, called the League of Just Men. And they were writing about what was going to be happening in America in the year 2000 in New York. So, the sun is, a, is, the, is again, we go back to this concept of the new day that was dawning. The sun would never set. And, of course, we go back to Manly P. Hall, who said that that sun uh, was a symbol for the blazing sun rising over the mountains of the east, was the symbol for the secret society. Well, as I said, it's a communist symbol of the secret societies, uh, and we see the sun rising behind the mountains of the east. Again, we're talking about the sun order. And you see it in Romania and uh, Mongolia, in uh, Armenia, State Seal of Santa Barbara, and Arizona, Illinois, we can go on for hours on this stuff, Montana, uh, Nevada, Ohio, uh, California Insurance, New York, here's the uh, city of New York, Seal, with the sun rising behind the mountains of the east, Obama's sun, Behind the Mountains, Rising Behind the Mountains. Now, there's a very important book that cannot be found today. It's a very, very good book, and I've got two copies of it. You can you can hardly find this book, and if you do, it's going to be extremely expensive. But it was a brilliantly uh, uh, put-together book on flags throughout the ages and across the world. And in this, uh, on page 130, you'll see... Uh, the symbol for the Soviet Union, Soviet Communist Party. And here again, as we stated at the very beginning, as the focal point of this whole presentation, this is the state arms for the old Soviet Communist Empire. But you will see uh, the sun rising over the um, earth, coming up onto the earth. And it says on the right-hand side, it says the Soviet which we're talking about Soviet communism. The Soviet coat of arms graphically presents, there it is again, the dawn of a new day for the entire world. So this is a very important symbol for world communism, is the dawning of a new day for the entire world. Keep that in mind. And you'll see it in different states, different communist states, the rising sun, the symbol of a new dawn for the country. Uh, symbols in Bolivia, you'll see it in Liberia. The sun rising, and it says the sun which heralds the new day, communist symbol in Liberia. In Cuba, the sun rising. You'll see it in uh, state arms, 
Costa Rica. Uh, here it is, as I as I told you before, this is the Mongolia. And it says, the horsemen racing into the sun, rising behind the mountains of the east. The horsemen racing, in, racing into the sun, which golden rays betoken prosperity, stands for the nation's advance toward communism. So there is a rising sun behind the mountains of the east, the symbol for the Illuminati bringing to the bringing to the world world communism people all over the world are being sucked into this and have no idea in the world that all of this stuff around the world is connected by secret societies operating out of new york and london here's romania and in romanian symbol you'll see on the bottom the rising sun expresses the promise of a new day when the sun is rising on the communist regime in romania and in Russia, again, even Soviet symbolism everywhere. Now, now we have something with the sun rising, but there's something now, a new uh, faction of this is called the Red Dawn. Of course, red was the symbol of communism, and communists were referred to in the West as reds. They even made movies. Communist Hollywood were making movies to glorify the rise of communism. Hollywood has always glorified Nazism, communism, fascism, any kind of isms, totalitarianism, anything that's filthy, degenerate. Uh, you know, Hollywood has always promoted politics as usual. Uh, they had a movie called Red Dawn. Yes, there was a Red Dawn, even for Malawi. A red sun, and it says, of course, red being communist, and the dawn is the symbol for the Illuminati. Uh, the sun to symbolize the dawning of a new day for Africa, and it was a new day for Africa. And Malawi was filled, once the communists took over, filled with bloodshed, blacks killing blacks, just massive murders of people. Then uh, for Angola, you'll see the red dawn. It's the, it represents the rising sun, another Soviet symbol. You'll see the red dawn and used in Soviet communist symbols everywhere. Even in communist China, the sunrise is red. And the Federation of Women Workers, you'll see in the background, is uh, in England, the red dawn. Uh, today, even Israel uses the watchtower symbolizing the Knights Templar Masonic Lodge, the Knights Templar Masonic Movement of Europe, their symbol is a watchtower, and behind it you'll see the Red Dawn, and of course the Eagle's Wings. Back to that mountain sunrise for a moment. That mountain sunrise, as Manly P. Hall said, was a blazing sun rising with the mountains of the east. Uh, you'll see that sunrise in buildings, like in New York, the Empire State Building is a set of sunrises. Inside, when you walk inside, you'll see the sun at the top emanating from the top of the Empire State Building. This is an interesting quote. It's talking about the Rockefeller Center. This was taken from a book written by David Rockefeller, and it's called Memoirs by David Rockefeller. And in it, he said this in his book, Memoirs, quote, for more than a century, ideological extremists at either of the political spectrum, either end of the political spectrum, have seized upon well-publicized incidents to attack the Rockefeller family. For inordinate influence, they claim we wield over American and political economic institutions. Some even believe that we're part of a secret cabal, working against the best interest of the United States. Characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build more integrated global political and ec economic structure. One will, one world, if you will. If that is the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. David Rockefeller. If that is the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. New York. The Empire State, Prometheus, World Communism. You'll see it in the Club of Rome, the sun rising behind the, the earth. Obama uses it. 
Back to that New Day thing. Fire in the minds of men. A whole revolutionary New Day dawning. You go to the uh, go to Google and, pop, and Communist New Day. Because remember, it says a more pointed assumption is that that New Day that was dawning, the sun would never set, and it was the solar myth of the revolution. So, go to Google and put in Communist New Day, and you'll see there's all kinds of... Um, articles about the Communist New Day. Here's one in particular. And at the bottom, it says, the red covering all over the USSR shows how much the world was under the leadership and control of the Communist Party. The morning sun, we're reading from the bottom, the morning sun bathes the hopeful gaze of the students and teachers with the warm light of the Communist New Day. Again, there's that term, Communist New Day. That's uh, the dawn of a new day for world communism. Very important term, dawn of the new day for the entire world under Soviet communism. Yep, Clinton with the dawn of a new day. Obama, the new day in America. The Soviet coat of arms graphically presents the dawn of a new day for the entire world. Does this tell you something about where America is today and where it's going? Hmm? Dawn of a new day in America. Go to uh, Google and put Obama and New Day and you will see there's almost 1,947,000 back then. Almost one million entries on the web talking about Obama bringing the dawn of a new day. It's everywhere. Barack Obama's dawn of a new day for America. A new day dawns for our country. Communist parties are static over the 08 election results. Voice of Marxism announced hard work is just beginning. Obama in Berlin, a new day and a new hope. Barack Obama, a new day is dawning. I don't know if you're getting the point of where we're going and who we are today in America, but we are a full-blown communist, Marxist, Leninist state. Again, go to, the, uh, go to the web and put in Obama, new day dawning. See how many hundreds of thousands of articles are written around the world on the new day that's dawning, the Soviet Communist Marxist New Day for America. And here's an article that says, as an activist dedicated to the participatory democracy, I am thrilled that tens of millions of voters and tens of thousands of volunteers have participated in this democratic nomination and breathed new life into our democracy the People's Democratic Republic of Cuba, the People's Democratic Republic of Romania, this great democratic republic. I have great respect, it goes on to say, I have great respect for our presidential candidates, particularly Senator Hillary Clinton, who has proved herself to be a champion of the working families. We are at the dawn of a new day and a new generation of leadership in America. Boy, we certainly are. The dawn of a new day of world communism. And here's Pete Seeger and uh, Bruce Springsteen singing about the coming of the new day, having no idea in the world what they're talking about. They are the Carpenters Union. They are celebrating the dawn of a new day, our new day dawns. Even uh, now their music being financed by um, Oprah is financing the new music albums for Obama. And it's going to be called, it's a new day. New day films in Hollywood. We're seeing this whole concept of brand new day, which represents the Illuminati communism for the whole world. And even... Um, even this goofball, um, John McCain. John McCain said, uh, those of us 
that made those that made us the Reagan revolution that brought about a new dawn of a new day in America. There's McCain using the same old communist terms, but you say, well, he was a conservative. Well, that's right. Conservatives were Nazis. So here is even a Nazi using the new dawn of a new day. But that's only reasonable because here in New York, the 1939 World Fair, and at the World's Fair in New York in 1839, uh, it was hailed as the dawn of a new day. The sun, uh, see the sun through the gray, it's the dawn of a new day. So as far back as 1939, New York World's Fair promoting the dawn of a new day. This stuff has been around for a long time and people have never known, never even saw it. And even the uh, symbol for the rising sun and the sun's logo, this was used by the uh, NAACP. Uh, more and more, even Las Vegas now uh, is now having shows in in Las Vegas called the New Day. Uh, here's the Baha'i religion in, uh, in Israel. The Baha'is are promoting this idea of a dawn of a new day. Uh, this is the Bible, daily Bible studies, dawn of a new day. This communist crap is all over the earth in churches, religions, entertainment, movies, music. The whole entire world is buying into the secret societies of the Illuminati who are bringing about the dawn of a new day, which is actually world communism. So you'll see all of this silly nonsense about the new day that's dawning for the Lord Jesus, and there's a new day coming, Bible study. Uh, here's a Christian radio shows called the New Day for America, New Day Community School. Fire in the Minds of Men talked about all of this and talked about how it traces the course of the revolutionary faith from its earliest origins in occult Freemasonry to the alleged scientific Marxism of today. So even they all, and even the old European lodges were called Rising Sun Lodges of Freemasonry. Secret societies again, we remember that quote, the sun, the sun orders of the Illuminati. Sun order, the dawning of a new day. Obama, Obama's uh, one of his um, one of his posters, a new day is dawning. Somebody had better wake up and understand what's going on here. Somebody needs to start doing their homework and realize that the symbols for world communism is now dominating America. We are now a full-blown Nazi, fascist, dictatorship, communist dictatorship, and the people of this country have no idea in the world. Christians are now uh, putting together New Day Christian Fellowship, New Day Christian Church, a grand new day, Christians are now flocking by the hundreds and thousands and millions to churches that are promoting this new day that's coming, a new day Christian center. This stuff is replete everywhere. Christians have bought 100% into this whole communist strategy. New day Christian churches, new day publishing for children, everything new day on the radio, new day churches, it's everywhere. Christians have bought into this and have no idea in the world that this is an Illuminati, well-planned trick to deceive the whole world and to buying into a new world order communist Nazi movement. I'll show you why I say communist Nazi, because there's not 10 cents worth of difference between any of them. New Day Christian Churches. God is bringing us and giving us a brand new day. It's really very sickening to see how gullible and ignorant and ill-informed the Christian world has been sucked into the new day that's dawning, which is nothing more than the old communist world takeover. 
And here, of course, we have uh, Americans that are praising and thanking God for the new day. Obama. Americans just love they love the idea. There are even tears in their eyes supporting the communist takeover of the United States and of the world. Yep. And uh, just like that article said, it says, the dawn of a new day for the entire world. Well, at the top, you'll see on the left, it says, around the world, joy at a new day that's dawning. Do you have school children wearing Obama masks in India? The entire earth is bought into this world communist Illuminati secret societies financed out of England and America to bring about a new world order, which is a communist Nazi movement to enslave the human race. So here is the bottom line for America today. America is left with two choices. You either have the right wing, Vatican, uh, Martin Bormann, Nazi, New World Order, Republicans, or you have the left wing, Soviet communism, New World Order, Democrats. Understand the right and the left wing of the eagle, the sun order. Right wing is Vatican, Holy Father, Morton Bormann, Adolf Hitler, Nazi, New World Order, Republicans. And the left wing is the Soviet Communist, New World Order, Democrats, Secret Society, Illuminati. Both are financed by the same secret societies. Here is Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler wrote a very important letter to the German people many years ago. And in it, he said, Germany can be saved only by a dictatorship of the national will and determination to take action. So he said, my fellow Germans, awaken. A new day is dawning. We're talking about Adolf Hitler now. And he's praising the new day that was dawning on the earth for Nazism. Again, the eagle and the sun. The sun order taking over the world. Here is an interesting uh, piece of information. Uh, the History Channel. I didn't do this. This is the History Channel did this. The History Channel has a, 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 a series of videos that they're selling. It's called World War II, The Lost Color Archives. It's three different uh, videos about World War II, and they found a lot of color uh, video, a color uh, film that was made during the Hitler's time. And so they put this out on the History Channel, and it's called The New World Order. And you can buy this whole set from the History Channel, New World Order. And what is it about? Well, the picture. It's about Adolf Hitler, because that's what the Nazis were trying to establish, as a new world order. And, of course, Bush was called the son of the new world order. This was in Time magazine. Obviously, he was the son of the new world order, because his family financed Adolf Hitler. The Bush family put up the money to finance Adolf Hitler and the murder of people all over the world. So that's why um, the History Channel has a television series called The New World Order about Adolf Hitler, and Bush is referred to as the son of the New World Order. I don't know if that tells you anything. And here is the New World Order, Adolf Hitler, and here's the Bushes who financed Adolf Hitler. They're still working on building a New World Order. And of course, behind all of this is, of course, the Vatican. The Pope calls for a new world order. You better find out. You'll see the Vatican, the Pope is wearing the sun rise on his, on his uh, papal headdress. Here is Adolf Hitler uh, in the Vatican with the uh, papal officials in the Vatican. 
because Adolf Hitler merely represented the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church represented Rome and the domination of the Roman Empire, and as far back as the Caesars, their symbol was um, the symbol of the sun, the sun order. So Hitler was a Catholic, was never excommunicated, financed, organized, directed by the Catholic Church. So, you just keep continuing to send money to the Holy Father, and one day, you're going to wake up and find out what the Catholic Church was really all about. Here on the American Experience, a program on the uh, <clears throat> PBS, PBS has a series called The Presidents, and when they were talking about George Bush, his program was called The New World Order. And here you will see on the left at the bottom, Bush is bowing, and, uh, and then um, you will have the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, kissing the ring of a foreign dictator. Uh, here's George Bush with the Pope, and Speaker of the House, Catholic Speaker of the House, who represents, supposedly represents uh, the Democratic Communist Party, in Washington, D.C., this pusillanimous piece of trash, Nancy Pelosi, uh, as Speaker of the House, bows and kisses the ring of a foreign dictator. I don't know what that tells you about Nancy Pelosi and the Bush administration. Might tell you something. And, uh, and uh, Condoleezza Rice, grinning like a chessy cat, is so pleased to see her bowing and kissing the ring of a foreign dictator. Rome. All roads lead to Rome. Communist, Nazi, fascist, everything that's filthy and degenerate leads back to Rome. Or we have the dawn of a new day, which is, of course, uh, Mrs. Clinton and the new day that's dawning for the world. So it doesn't matter. America is finished. It's completely done in. So the two last thoughts. Number one, William Guy Carr, many years ago, retired as a uh, commander from the Canadian Navy. He wrote a book back in 1950s, in the early 50s, he wrote a book, uh, William Guy Carr, retired Royal Canadian Navy, wrote a book called Pawns in the Game. I had this book in 1959. You can still get it today. It's a very important book on the symbols of the Illuminati. 1959, almost 50 years ago. And in this, he was talking about <clears throat> Albert Pike, who was at that, who was back in the 1870s, was the um, Grand Master of World Freemasonry. And Albert Pike on the left wrote a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini, the Italian, uh, the Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini, who was also a high degree Mason in European Masonry. We're talking about European Masonry. And in his book, um, Albert Pike wrote this. On, on August 15th, 1871, August 15th, 1871, Pike, Albert Pike on the left, wrote a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini, Italian um, Mason. It says, Pike told Mazzini, Pike, in 1871, Pike told Mazzini that after World War III is ended, those who aspire to undisputed world domination will provoke the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known. We quote his own written words taken from a letter cataloged in the British Museum in London. Here's what Albert Pike, as far back as 1871, wrote to Giuseppe Mazzini. He said, quote, We shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in all of its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origins of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves 
against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and then the multitude of the world disillusioned with Christianity but whose deistic spirits will be from that moment without compass or direction, but anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into public view, a manifestation which will result in the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Read over that and think about what you're reading. That was written as far back as 1871 about the world minority of revolutionaries bringing to the world terrorism. And it says we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, showing that this has been planned as far back as 1871, these guys are good. So that's your Obama New World Order. Uh, this is where your hope for the future of America should go. And the second and last point I want to make is that there's a new, there was a movie, uh, a television show came out many years ago called V the original miniseries it was on NBC called V. Well, NBC, uh, that was the original, was done by NBC. Well, now Disney ABC, uh, ABC is owned by Disney. Disney's ABC has done a new version, brought it up to date with a new television series called V. <clears throat> and in the new television series V, the aliens... Uh, hand out a track in the movie and it's talking about what the aliens are going to do as they take over the whole world and the track that they're explaining what they're going to do is called Welcome to the Dawn of a New Day so ABC Disney is slyly telling you world communism is taking over the entire world. Mankind has, cannot even begin to fathom what's going on. And even Disney ABC is showing you that they are aware that what's going on with this new communist dawn of a new day is all part and parcel of something even far, far bigger and deeper than you know. And they're telling you that this is, uh, they're bringing it to you in the new television series called V. Somebody needs to wake up and get a life and start learning what these symbols mean. Thank you.